pharmacy law. We're all law-abiding citizens, or at least I hope so. I discussed you needed uh, some law requirements to even be able to sit for the exam, so hopefully you're familiar with law just in general. But pharmacy law, there are a few different things that you're probably not aware of, so I want to discuss that. Uh, some of the scheduling of medications, or whenever you hear the term control medication. I need you to know what that means for the exam. So let's jump right into it. Let's start with the Controlled Substances Act. Because of the addictive potential of some of these medications, regulation is needed. There's a lot of diversion that happens. You know, it can get out to the street. It can get out to where people are dealing it that aren't authorized to do so. And because of that, the government puts a little bit of red tape for you to do to be able to make sure that that doesn't happen. As I'm sure you're all too aware, there's nothing that has been done to this point that can completely keep it from happening. But these are all measures to at least deter it. The medications are separated into different classes. We have controlled drugs. Um, these are addictive and some increased regulation is going to be needed. There's non-controlled drugs and these are not as likely to be addicted. Think diabetes medications or blood pressure medications. Uh, drugs can be changed from non-control to control. It does happen occasionally where there is not a lot of regulation on one medication and suddenly it jumps into control. The drug Soma or Carisoprodol was like that. It used to be non-control and then it got moved to control. Now the Controlled Substances Act, who enforces it? It's the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. Doesn't that make sense? The Drug Enforcement Agency? They keep tabs on all the controlled substances that are manufactured and sold. They'll make the decision to change the schedule of a drug. So when I talked about Soma changing the schedule earlier, it was the DEA that decided that. They issue a unique number to all prescribers of controlled medications. They also issue a unique number that's also called a DEA number to all pharmacies. Now, just so you know, it's not pharmacists that have a DEA number. It's the pharmacy itself. So one pharmacy will have a DEA number, but each prescriber of controlled substances will have a DEA number as well. So let's talk about this DEA number, because you'll need to be able to tell if one is fake. Um, occasionally you'll see where someone tries to make up a DEA number, tries to get a script filled that isn't authorized by an actual physician. Whenever something like that happens, you'll want to notify the authorities and take care of it immediately. The DEA number is comprised of two letters and seven numbers. The first letter, it's assigned by the DEA. Most of the time, you'll see it be A or B. Um, it will depend. It's usually having to do with what the practice is. If it's a nurse practitioner, it'll have a different first letter than, say, a medical doctor. But the first letter is assigned by the DEA. The second letter is the first letter of the prescriber's last name. First letter. So mine, my last name is Pettit, mine would be P. Again, I'm a pharmacist, I don't have a DEA number, but just an example. One little pitfall you might want to be aware of is some ladies get married, of course, and their last name will change, but perhaps they got the DEA number before they got married, and they will have their maiden name as the first letter on there. So don't just get scared away by that if it seems to be a different first letter than what's in their uh, DEA number. The numbers themselves are not random. We've talked about the two letters. The seven numbers after that actually have a mathematical formula to be able to figure them out. So let's start out with an example DEA number. Let's look at the example BP1234563. Huh, it's funny, it's the, the same thing I have as a combination to my luggage. Nah, just kidding, kind of a dated reference. Anyway, so we'll look at these, and first I want us to look at the first, third, and fifth numbers on here. The first three odd numbers that you see on here. And we're going to look at those, one, three, five, and we're going to add them together. Okay, and that will get us number nine. So we've added the first, the third, and the fifth numbers to get number nine. Next, we're going to add the second, the fourth, and the sixth number. Okay, so number here, two, four, and six. And with that, of course, we'll get 12. So I've added the first, the third, and the fifth, and now the second, the fourth, and the sixth. With our even numbers, however, we need to double that. So we're going to multiply that 12 and we're going to get 24. So 12 times 2 is 24. So now we have two numbers, number 9 on the top and number 24 on the bottom, 
and we're going to add those two numbers together. And those will get us a total of 33. So 33 is 9 and 24 added. And now I really just need to look at the last digits of this DEA number. So I have 3 on the bottom and then 3 on the top. And they do indeed match. So this is a valid DEA number. Put a check mark next to it. So whenever you're looking at DEA numbers, look at both that checksum as well as the last name. Uh, we're looking at the first initial of the last name, in this case P. I've put it for myself for, uh, for Pettit. So let's talk about the DEA control schedule. You'll hear me say that's schedule 2, that's uh, schedule 3 through 5. Well, let's discuss what that actually means. Schedule 1 is a medication of zero accepted medical use. Cocaine or heroin or ecstasy. Any of those have no real accepted medical use. Um, and that's why they're Schedule 1. And for the most part, you're not going to find anything like that in a pharmacy. Therefore, Schedule 1. Schedule 2, and we'll talk a little bit more about these because this is a very important schedule, is uh, where we're going to have a lot more addictive substances. They're the most abused substances, but they do have a medical use. Um, but a really high abuse. An example is oxycodone or hydromorphone. A lot of red tape comes with these Schedule II medications, and we'll get into that in a bit. But these have the most potential for abuse out of all the medications in a pharmacy. The next two schedules are 3 and 4, or you'll hear them called C3 or C4. The Schedule III medications do have a medical use. There's still a chance for abuse, uh, but not to the degree of those Schedule II medications. Same thing with the Schedule 4. They do have a chance for abuse, but not as much as 3, and certainly not as much of a chance of abuse as Schedule 2 medications. Schedule 5 medications, again, do have a medical use. They have the least potential for abuse out of all the control medications. This is still a controlled substance whenever it's C5. So do know that. Um, it's not like I can put blood pressure or diabetes medications here in Schedule 5. These are still controlled medications, um, but they do have a medical use and they're not as addictive or chance for abuse as Schedule 2, 3, or 4. There is a logo on the manufacturer's bottles that will let you know that they're controlled. And it's exactly what these logos look like right here, which is a large C with a number in between it signifying 2, 3, 4, and 5. Again, hope you learned your Roman numerals because you'll need to know what these are by uh, seeing them. So. Schedule 2, Schedule 3, Schedule 4, and Schedule 5 logos are seen right there. I promised we would talk more about Schedule 2 medications, and here we are. They have special restrictions on them. For a Schedule 2 medication, it has to have an original prescription, the actual piece of paper with the doctor's handwriting on there. No uh, prescription that's faxed in, no prescription that's telephoned in. This has to be the actual old-fashioned paper prescription. No refills are allowed either. So whatever's written on the prescription, they're not going to be able to add a refill or two on there. Schedule two medications do not allow refills. Remember that. Remember that. If you get 12 fills of a Schedule two medication over the course of a year, you're going to need 12 prescriptions. Now under federal law, not state law, but federal law, Schedule two medications do not expire as to where the non-control medications do expire after 12 months and then they expire after six months for the controlled medications that are C3 through 5, Schedule 2 medications do not expire under federal law. However, this is a big however, under state law they do have an expiration date. Always whenever you have federal and state at odds with each other, you go with the more stringent of the two laws. So just because federal does not have a, uh, a expiration date for a Schedule II medication, your state does. For instance, I'm a pharmacist in Texas, and we have 21 days. Um, it used to be seven days, but federal does not have a limit. Your state will. Some additional restrictions are going to vary from state to state. So just because mine's 21 in Texas doesn't mean yours will be. The Schedule 3 through 5 prescriptions, as I mentioned uh, just on the last slide, they expire six months from the date written. The non patrol prescriptions expire one year later. So how do you order these Schedule 2 medications? There actually is red tape involved. Imagine the DEA wants to keep tabs on where these medications are going. 
if it's all going to one part of the country, you can bet there will be more abuse going in more in that part of the country. So to order them, you need to use a form known as DEA 222, the Drug Enforcement Agency Form 222. That is how you will order drugs. Write that down, repeat it. There's a great chance that will be a law question on your exam. DEA, DEA Form 222 is what is used to be able to order Schedule II medications. Let's say there's a lot of controlled substances that have been lost or stolen. You're going to use DEA Form 106. DEA Form 106, again, a great chance that could be uh, asked of you on the exam is what do you do whenever there's lost or stolen medications. You will need to fill out DEA Form 106. So that's it for pharmacy law. Just a tiny fraction of the exam is on pharmacy law. There is a lot to learn in this lecture and another lecture I have for pharmacy law. You'll have to recall some amendments and some acts and things like that. That being said, please learn the pharmacy law, not just so you can do well on the exam, but just so you'll be a, a legal technician, one that actually follows the, the rules and knows the ins and outs of the law dealing with pharmacy. Learn this, learn it well, get a few more questions right on the exam.